Hi everyone, thank you so much for watching Behind the Brand. I want to give a special shout out to my friends at Pixability for making this episode possible. And don't forget to subscribe. It actually makes a huge difference to convince the people that don't believe you can watch awesome content like this for free on YouTube. Hope you enjoy the next episode. Thanks for watching. Hi, my name is Carlton Calvin and I'm president of Razor and you're watching Behind the Brand. Hi, I'm Brian Elliott. Welcome to another edition of Behind the Brand. Today I'm here with founder and president of Razor, Carlton Calvin. Carlton, welcome to the show. Thank you. Carlton, I usually ask my guests, how'd you get this job? <laughs> I started the company, so it's an easy job to get. <laughs> so for those who don't know about Razor or have never ridden one of your scooters, tell us what uh, the company's about. Okay, well, we make uh, quite a few different wheel goods. The most famous for the original Razor scooter, the aluminum scooter that uh, hit the market in 2000. But the majority of our business now is electric uh, vehicles, whether that's electric scooters or motorcycles, the famous crazy car, that kind of thing. How'd you get started? Well, um, I was in the toy business and selling um, hot items, items that were a craze. And the item that I was selling at that time was fingerboards, which is a kind of, uh, like, it's, it's very similar to Tech Deck. It was before Tech Deck fingerboards. And I read in the LA Times that the Razor scooter was the hottest item in Japan. And I thought to myself, oh, I'm going to license the Razor brand for a t and make a teeny little Razor scooter and sell that as a toy. And I met the owner of the company and my partner, Robert, who was working with the company. And um, we decided it was a much better idea to sell, to create the Razor company, create a brand Razor and sell them, you know, globally. Now we talked off camera a little bit that you wanted to be a filmmaker. I did originally. I, my background is I wanted. I, I when I was in college, I wanted to be a filmmaker, but I was too scared to take the big plunge. <laughs> so I'm, I'm I'm cautious by nature. Believe it or not, as an entrepreneur, I'm very risk averse. So I went to law school, but my secret plan was to um, become an entertainment lawyer, and then work my weasel my way into the film business. Um, I was being an entertainment lawyer for, um, you know, probably about eight months and my friend got sick and I took a leave of absence from my job and to take care of him and that's when I started my business in my garage. Wow. And then what happened? Okay, so I was, you know, taking, you know, taking about a year off of uh, work and after he died I decided uh, I really didn't want to go back and be a lawyer. So um, I just was casting around for something to do. And I heard that hogs and slammers were the hottest craze in Los Angeles at that time. And um, so I decided, mm, maybe I'll make some hogs and slammers. And I was driving through the Arizona desert and I saw a paperweight with a scorpion embedded in a paperweight. And I thought, wow, that's gonna be a great toy for kids if I could. Uh, okay, so I should back up. A slammer and a paw, a slammer is a big disc you throw at a stack of pogs, which are other paper discs, and uh, the ones that flip over you get to keep. It's essentially gambling for kids. So I took, I was gonna make a slammer with a real scorpion in it. I went, uh, I called the company, turned over the paperweight, called the company, and I said, uh, I'd like to have some scorpions. They sent me 100 in a little glass jar. I went into my garage. Six months later, I came out with a real scorpion embedded in a clear little pog. I went to a toy show in Pomona, and the first day, a distributor walked by and offered to buy 200,000 of them from me at $2 a piece, no questions asked, and he would fund my company to get started if I would be exclusive to him. And that's how I got started in business. I, the funny thing is I went, then I, I went back and I called the um, little, the, the, company in Arizona where I got this 100 scorpions and I said I need 200,000 scorpions and they said you, you've got to be kidding we go out in the middle of the night in the desert with black lights and open turn over rocks and grab the scorpions by hand we can maybe send you a thousand yeah wow so flash forward to the scooter craze yes um, it's it's changed a lot yes it's evolving yes you're into electric scooters and Talk to us about the brand a little bit. Like, how do you how do you innovate? Um, well, the innovation sort of is just in the very nat you know deep blood of our company. So uh, 
you know, we have an extremely small team of, you know, creative people at the company that look, basically think about new wheel goods. And so we're always, you know, we're always looking for new, there, there's basically two or three ways that we do it. One is, you know, we use inventors to come into the company and we pick out what we think is cool. Uh, otherwise, it's sort of um, looking for a trend that might be hot somewhere in the world just like with the Razor Scooter originally, and then we bring in the United States. So are you listen, you're doing a lot of listening like through social media? Or are you guys pretty active in social? Uh, we're very active in social, not so much from the listening end, but of course we do make, you know, vid videos have been, in the last couple of years, videos have been extremely important to our business. Talk to us about that. We're here at VidCon today. You can hear all the excitement. There's tons of YouTube creators, young people, uh, people actually of all ages who are creating original stuff. Talk to us about how important YouTube has been for your marketing. So, my YouTube, my big YouTube story is that uh, a couple years ago, we developed a new product called the Crazy Cart, which is essentially a go-kart that spins around in circles. Very, very exciting item. Uh, we put it on the shelf and basically no sales. Then the uh, guy at my company who, you know, sort of uh, created the Crazy Cart also is a very creative filmmaker. He made a video called Introducing the Crazy Cart, and it got a million and a half views. The first one okay. was just a little, you know, uh, video of him racing his bu buddy okay, so on the crazy cart. Okay, gotcha. And uh, they, but it, that immediately blew up, and the, immediately after that, the sales took off at retail. So it's, it's an incredible correlation. I always say that it was good, you know, as much valuable to me as two or three million dollars worth of advertising wow. on TV. It was to get this viral video. And then, the, and then of course, when you have a viral video, coverage, you know, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, everybody watches the viral video, and so you get traditional public relations too. Did that guy get a raise? Uh, he got a promotion and a raise in his own department. <laughs> and actually, when I saw that happen, that I had never seen anything like that happen. It really transformed my thinking about marketing for the company. And the, I, the, I, like within two months, I said, okay, we're opening up a YouTube department yeah. and we're gonna hire filmmakers. We're gonna make, all we're gonna do is make <laughs> videos. Really? Um, and the first video to come out of that was the, Jim, the Ken Box video. which is a play on the Ken Block, Jim Gymkhana videos. Yeah. And right, six weeks after his first viral video, this guy made another viral video that you know got a million and a half views. Now it's up to three million. It's really well done, it's super fun. Yeah. Um, so talk to us how you're developing new content now. It's, you know, a lot of people call it content as a strategy. Right. Which is really pull versus push, right? It's, it's focused on entertaining or solving a problem or inspiring. You guys, I mean, it's pure, Eye candy, it's so, so fun to watch. What are you thinking of next? What's coming down the pipe? My lesson is it turned out to be harder to create videos, viral videos, than I thought, and to get, you know, put a team together. So we're still in the process of doing that. So uh, we're gonna release like another, you know, Ken Box video this year. We're gonna do another video uh, on a brand, another series of videos on a brand new product we have. So, but we're still really putting, trying to put together a team of talented YouTubers who have the ability to make really compelling content. And you know, I've got, I've thought a lot about it. Yeah, and it's, you know, to make a viral video, you guys know, I mean, everybody here knows how hard it is. And you have to really be fresh, and it's, that's a hard thing to do. Well, I would even go as far as to say, you can't make a viral video. Right, you intentionally. Can't, yeah. Right, you can't right. manufacture it, right? There's right. certain tent poles, right? You need right. to have it be awesome, and it, or it needs to be horrific, like a train wreck, because everyone wants to watch it, or right. super funny, but, it really is hard to capture that lightning in a bottle, yeah. It is, and it's, it, it requires as much talent to make a 
viral videos it does to make a movie or a song. And, there, and it, that's the art. It's not a science yet. So what are your metrics? I mean, you go, let's say you go out and make your next video and it falls short of you know, the virality. Right. How are you measuring success? Well, Because that ha there's some expense there, yeah? There is an expense. Can you tell us kind of a range of what you're spending sure. per video? Yeah, we, we put out videos all the time that we, you know, that are just, you know, $1,000 or $2,000 just go out and film. Yeah. You know, fortunately we have exciting, you know, products that move and have wheels and you get some views. But that Jim Connor video was not a couple thousand no. dollars. So then we have sort of these ten, what, you, what we call sort of like ten ball. I mean, obviously it's not Spider-Man 6, yeah. but it's, that might cost us thirty or forty thousand okay. dollars. So that's what we'll do on those. Okay, it's great to know. So when you spend that much and you just said maybe you're getting two to four million dollars return on the investment, that's incredible. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. So that's why I'm so excited. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Understandably so. Um, you know, you can't have success without failure. Right. And a lot of people say, oh failure's not an option. But really that's not true. Failure has to be the option in order to get the success. Talk to us about some of the failures you've had along the way to your successes. Are you talking about video, in particular, particularly about videos? Well, it can be, but you know, a lot of people watch the show, they're entrepreneurs. Right. And I think a lot of them maybe get stuck, stuck in the, in the, in the fact that, oh, if I don't get it right the first time out of the gate, you know, I don't want to do it. Right. So that's like this analysis paralysis. First of all, we've had, video failures that we said, okay, we're going to spend $20,000 on this video and it just gets 5,000 views. Have you ever taken a video down because it was so bad? No, we don't really have that strategy. You know, what I, and this is what I tell my video makers, they get very discouraged, or even my product development people. You know, it's, it's as hard to make a hit product as it is to make a hit video. They're all artistic endeavors, in a sense. There's a magic to it that you cannot, it's the hardest thing to find in a business is to find somebody come in and be the Steve Jobs and come up with the great ideas. And the same thing for the videos. So I always say, but the great thing about any of this stuff is that nobody remembers your failures because nobody bought it, nobody saw it. Right. So you're not famous for your failures, you're famous for your hits. So it's a very, you, you can't let yourself get down. Yeah, I started my business uh, before I did the Pogs. I thought I was gonna be a children's book publisher. And it's only because I was talking to illustrators that I figured out I could get into this Pogs and Slammers business. So life has this, you know, the, the important message there is start your business. Get going, be active. And some, you know, if you have a talent for business, which not everybody does, you know, something will present itself where you can make money. The most exciting problem is uh, the failure to anticipate uh, the slowdown in the original scooter market. When the first scooter first started, I was selling one million scooters a month at $60 a, a scooter. That's $60 million in revenue a month yeah. from a company, I had four people when I started the company. So I was amazing chaos and six months later I couldn't sell a single scooter. Everybody in America had one. Literally saturated the market. Yeah. And I, but meanwhile, I, they were coming in a million scooters a month <laughs> into my warehouse. I had a million scooters piled up. That was a big mistake, almost killed the company. But to my partner's great credit, he said, do not give up. My, my deal was, oh, I made some money. I'm just gonna like, I'm gonna retire, let my wife work, <laughs> you know? And, and, and he goes, no, 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 just, you gotta be patient. We're gonna work through these scooters and we're gonna develop new products. So it was a not giving up from, that's a classic, important not giving up from a very discouraging situation. You know, to have, it was an unbelievably large amount of scooters I had to warehouse. Over the years, I've learned to delegate a tremendous amount to my employees. So pretty much, at least the people that work to report directly to me, each one is their own little entrepreneurial boss. So it's a super, through and through, super informal, no meetings, ideas just bubble up from everybody, and that, in a very positive reinforcement type environment. Uh, the best advice, I've got a lot of, I guess, this is off the cuff, so I don't have, I don't have prepared advice, but uh, you know, I always say, try to get involved in a market, when you're just little and starting, try to get involved in a market that's exploding, because the big players won't have a chance to react the same way you can. So you can be little quick, yeah, and, it, I need to get back. and you just can't imagine when you're, you know, some people who are starting, how hard it is to get visibility. So you have the momentum of a market behind you where you're part of a craze or a trend 
that's really explosive, that's a good place to jump in and start to find your way. Uh, secondly, be very careful with money <laughs> because, you know, uh, being economical is a key component, not wasting money. You know, if you can do things on a shoestring budget, you're, you've got the entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, be prepared to work extremely hard. It's part of saving money, but you'll be working 15, 16 hours a day as an entrepreneur. Um, and, but it, and I also, what I'm always telling people is r relish those ex times. Because the entrepreneurial time, when you're just starting those first few, few years, when it's just you and a couple of people, those are the most exciting times you'll ever have in business. Once you get a big staff and you're telling everybody what to do, it's completely boring, <laughs> comparatively. Hire a salesperson, <laughs> a professional salesperson. You know, uh, people starting out in business often think, oh, I can do, handle the sales myself, I can handle the contacts with the buyers, or where. almost every business has sales involved. You can go with, but you need somebody out there and who's gonna manage a team of salespeople, keeping them busy all the time. It's a numbers game. The sales is a numbers game. So you need a lot of contacts. We've been spending a little time with Carlton Calvin, founder and president of Razor. Carlton, thanks for being on the show.